Okay, here we go. So this is our first Monday live Q&A and I'm here answering your questions. So we had a lot of folks send in some questions ahead of time, which is fantastic. Um, so we can have some to start out getting warmed up with. And just so everybody knows, when you comment on Facebook, it will have about a 20 second delay before I'm able to see it and reply to it. Um, so here we go. So the first question that I had um, was from Tammy. And Tammy asked, how can I stop my dog from pulling and hunting squirrels, rabbits, and cats um, on a walk? And he cannot tell the difference. Um, so between, it sounds like he cannot tell the difference um, between these critters and cats. Not uncommon at all. So our dogs are both predators and scavengers. And it sounds like your dog has a higher prey drive than some. Um, it is, you think of their prey drive as something that's totally normal and part of their, their, their hunting software that they come with. Now, all of our dogs have a different degree of this hunting software in them. And when we've got a dog who's very interested um, with critters um, such as squirrels, rabbits, and they might even see cats as these critters too because they're about the same size and can act the same. Um, we say that a dog has a higher prey drive. So things that you can do to help with a dog that has a higher prey drive is by having first some management gear. So here's my handy dandy little helper dog. And my favorite go-to is a Freedom No Pull Harness. It has an attachment in the front and the back. The key point here though is the front. Um, the front is what's going to help to pull the back toward dog back towards you when you go to move to help you to gain some control. Now there's other things that you can do. If you have a dog that is very into um, chasing critters and wanting to get towards them, what you can do is give them some legal outlets for this. No, it doesn't mean that your dog is going to all of a sudden um, want them even more. In fact, it's going to help to release some of that steam that's building up and building up and building up and they never get to release. So ways that you can provide these legal outlets for your dogs are with um, a flirt pole. Now, a flirt pole is essentially like one of those giant cat toys. Um, uh, but with a tuggy toy in the end. And you can use this to um, give them that opportunity to chase and catch things. And you can use it as an opportunity to also teach them some impulse control, teaching them when they can go get it, when you cue it, and then when to drop it. So that is what you can do in the interim as a short. Um, there's other things that you can do, like you can teach your dog um, a, a nice leave it to squirrels, critters, cats, moving objects and such. Um, that, that does take some building up. Um, you can't just start saying leave it when you're out on the walk and expect your dog to do it. You have to first build up a solid foundation and then add in distractions. Um, of course, we'd be to help, happy to help you with that if that is something that you are in need of help with. Um, so that is um, Tammy's question. And now we're going to move on to our next one, which is from Susan. So Susan emailed asking, or messaged us on Facebook, asking about resource guarding. So it sounds like um, it's resource guarding specifically towards humans in the home. And he will this is guard, or she, I did not get if it was a he or a she, will guard a uh, dish towels, can opener, an open dishwasher, and even a plastic bag. So this can seem odd to us, because why would they guard a plastic bag or the dishwasher? I can't open for goodness sakes. But 
our dogs are going to decide what they think or perceive as resources to them and to your dog for whatever reason has decided it's these things now when i was reading over this i was looking at it and saying what do these things have in common these are all things that would be in the kitchen so the kitchen may be a hard a high charged place for your dog and um, so it could be other things like the fact that food is being prepped in those kitchens maybe his dinner bowl is in there um, even if it's empty a dinner bowl can still have a, a value to it um, so what i would do in this situation is first off prevent your dog from continuing to rehearse this behavior it's not fun for you it's not fun for them um, and so what I would do is um, put them uh, behind a gate in another room when you are going to be in the kitchen um, and doing food prep. Um, uh, I even have a gate right across my kitchen that I can use at any point in time that I want. So it could be open and close it as I go along. It's a nice swinging one so that when I am tired or lazy, I don't just step over it um, like those squeeze gates and then hurt myself, which I'm smiling because I've done more than once. So I invested just in those nice smooth swing gates that you can just attach to one side of your wall and it goes. The other option is there's a squeeze gate type that you can also still have the swing option and um, but not uh, drill into your walls if you do not want to. I know that you know drilling into our walls if you're renting that's can be a stuff something that you don't want to do be, so that you can get your deposit back so that's an option so right away management trying to figure out um, you know if it's if, if I'm correct and assuming that this is mostly happening in the kitchen um, the next thing that I would want to um, provide somebody guidance with is what do you do when your dog is guarding? It's scary to us. Uh, you know, dogs have teeth, and we know that you know if they use their teeth, we could potentially get hurt. Um, so, what we do, what our natural instinct is to do is to tell them to stop doing that. No, stop it! Ah, you know, we freak out, and then our dog is like Meh, shocked a little sometimes. Other times, they then go forward more. Um, because they're feeling threatened and so what we need to do instead is fight against our nature which is to tell this dog to stop it and instead say whoa okay and back the heck off when a dog is is giving body language and verbal language with the growling you know hunkering over an item um, the hair is up on the back of their hackles. Um, they're giving you the, what we call the hard eye where it's really hard and intense and they're not blinking and their body's very stiff. That is them asking for you to give them space so that they do not have to move forward and up this pyramid of, say, of having to um, resort to using their mouth. So if we say, whoa, okay, we hear you, and then back the heck off, that's immediately relieving um, some pressure from the situation. Then, you know, if it's not something is, that is dangerous for them or very precious for me, um, I would just let it go. <laughs> if it was something dangerous, like a plastic bag, for example, could be very dangerous if they tried to swallow it um, and then it gets stuck. So um, then what I would do next is after I've relieved that pressure, is I would, if I needed to get it away from them, go for what's called a bait and switch. Now, what that would mean is that I would grab some of the yummiest food rewards that I have handy. And if I knew I had a garter in my home, you can betcha that I'm gonna have some prepped and ready to go and in the fridge and maybe in a few other places that this sort of guarding has occurred in the past. So that it's very easy for me to have it on the fly. My favorite is the Talenti containers because um, they screw on the top. Very easy for you to stash somewhere. I've got some stinky Zeewee Peaks in here, some mackerel and lamb that is pretty stinky. So I would have this 
up and somewhere on a shelf so that I can have it handy and ready for me to go. Then for the bait and switch, what I would do is I would approach my dog, but I would not go straight at them. I would instead go at this sort of C curve. So I'm not putting this full frontal here I come pressure on them. I'm doing this nice little side approach, being very um, non-pressuring as much as I possibly can. Then I'm going to get my hand with the food in it as close as I can um, and then give it a toss on the floor. And my goal is to get them interested in that food that I'm tossing onto the floor. Maybe even if they drop the item and then start to go towards it, but they're still kind of close, drop some more to have them go further away from it. I can go in there and snag the item away so that they don't get harmed, I don't get harmed, then I write down, okay, plastic bags. That is something I have to make sure that are not going to be at the ready there. And then I'm also going to put that on my training plan checklist. To resolve um, what this is actually called, um, resource guarding. Object guarding is a part of our subfolder in resource guarding. And what we would do to help a dog to feel better about things that he, they have deemed as resources is first start out by creating this nice hierarchical list. You know, what are all the things that my dog has guarded in the past? Which ones does he guard the least? Which one does he guard like his life depends on it? I'm gonna order and rank those. Then I am most likely gonna start with something that uh, we call a dummy object. Now this is something that a dog has absolutely never guarded in the past. Sometimes that can be tough to find if you've got a dog who's a um, very good guarder, but um, things that I've used in the past are a coffee cup, a stapler, um, other random objects that you can kind of find around the house. What we do then is teach the dog that our approach to them with this object and us reaching down and picking it up, boom, leads to good stuff. It leads to chicken or cheese or spam, a dog favorite. I give them the spam, then I give the thing back and I walk away. So it teaches them that my approach and picking up of this object is a predictor of good things happening and it's no big deal. So we teach in that game with the dummy object and then we slowly work up to the other objects. Now there can be lots of different variables that we need to consider when we're doing this and you really need to learn dog body language because dog body language can be very subtle and if your dog has learned that it's not okay for them to growl or do other certain things that have made us feel uncomfortable that we've told them not to do, they can fly through that dog uh, behavior um, pyramid, body language pyramid, up to getting close to that bite or just, or just skip some of those steps because they're not going to waste their energy um, giving you a hard stare or a growl if you've always told them in the past that that doesn't work. So. Learning body language is very important there. So I hope that helps. Um, resource guarding is something that is um, actually on the, on the side of fear and aggression goes, is, is on the easier side to treat. Being that it's objects is a little bit tougher, um, but it is still, you are still able to uh, modify this behavior for sure. Okay, so let's look at a couple of the comments that we had come in here, and then I can always go back to some of the, the pre-sent in questions. Okay, so Mary's asking, how can you stop a barky dog? She barks at most noises outside. She barks at the washing machine when it dings, sounds on the TV, etc." So, good question there, Mary. Um, first thing is we have to figure out why is your dog, why is your dog barking? is there's a couple, there's about four different reasons that your dog um, will bark um, to help communicate to you 
um, or to somebody else um, uh, how they're feeling. So we have watchdog barking. So watchdog barking is when a dog is saying, hey, I see you. I'm telling everybody I see you. They're doing their job essentially. Now, this is why we brought dogs into our homes way back when, was to alert us when they saw changes in the environment. So you typically you'll see dogs do this when they're in the home and they're watching things moving by. That's watch dog barking. Um, in that sort of a circumstance, a dog is what I'd say not upset. Um, the next would be request or demand barking. And this would be if a dog was barking at you um, and looking at you and barking at you and the rest of their body was all happy, happy, Lucy, Lucy. That's them saying, give this to me right now. Give me your attention. Give me that food in your pocket. Again, not an upset dog. Um, then we've got dogs who are bored, who just don't have anything else to do with themselves and bark, bark, bark. Then we have the spooky barking. And that's what it sounds like is going on, Mary, um, with your dog here with the, the different noises. We've got your dog who's spooking to that noise. It was something um, that, that novel, you know, novel and then it scared her and boom, bark, 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 bark. Um, when you've got mach uh, when you've got noises like the um, where is it the washing machine um, and the sounds on the TV the washing machine that's a good one to start out with that is one that you can um, work with because it can be kind of predictable so you know when you turn on that washing machine. Um, about when that ding is going to happen. And you know at this point that that ding is like, ah, she barks at it and is like, I don't like that ding. Um, so what you're going to do is you would, um, well, before you hit that go on the dishwasher, you're going to prep a bunch of really yummy things like chicken, baked chicken or spam, you know, something that you've tested out and you know that your dog really likes and that they don't get it any other time. You're gonna prep that all up. You're gonna put have that at the ready. Then you're going to hit the washing machine go and you're going to wait for that ding to happen. Soon as that ding happens, your dog is going to hear it and then you are going to throw a party. You're gonna to run to the spam or the chicken and be like, oh my God, it was the dishwasher, yeah! And then you're just gonna give her handfuls of that chicken. Then you're gonna stop and go back to being boring. And if your dishwasher does more than one ding, fabulous, you get to do more than one repetition. So same thing, ding happens, she hears it, you start throwing a party, and then the party stops. Um, so you could do that with any sort of noises that um, that you could con control. I mean, you can also do it opportunistically with noises you can't control. Um, it just gets a little bit tougher, all right? Because you can't say, okay, be done, noise, go away. <laughs> um, you would also want to, um, you know, I keep a log of these different sounds um, and, and seeing, you know, which ones are harder for her um, so that you can work through them. You could use a Bluetooth speaker and say an app on your phone um, that could imitate the noise. You could even record the noise and use a Bluetooth speaker to play it. And I'm saying Bluetooth because that is going to sound more realistic than if you were just playing a recording from your phone. Um, and if the, if she is so anxious that she is constantly barking at different sounds like all day, that might be a consideration where you'd also want to speak with your veterinarian about what's going on and to see if there's any behavioral meds that could be helpful and working with a professional behavior consultant to help work you through what would be a behavior modification plan for her for these. Okay, so I hope that's helpful. Okay, so then, whoops. We have got, I forgot, I could pull this over. Um, 
background, make the background a little. Okay, so Emily, what's the most effective way to teach dog to drop things? And of course, sorry, new program. Most effective way to teach drop, he likes to try to pick up anything while we go on walks. Um, so the first thing that you would do, Emily, is you would um, teach your dog how to drop things out of context. And I would start with their toys, you know, getting them kind of eager and amped up with their toys. And <clears throat> you would start by having food in your hand. I've got my fake dog. I could download a video, but it would take too much time and you guys would have to wait for me. So if a dog had an object, I want it to be in their mouth. I'm going to have food in my hand and I am going to bring it straight up to their nose. I'm not going to say anything. I want them to smell this food that I've been placing right on their nose and let them make a call. Should I drop that toy for that food? Most of them are going to say yes, especially if you have something of high value. As soon as they drop that item, you're going to say yes to mark that exact behavior. Opening the mouth and dropping that toy is what got them the food. Then you're going to pick up the toy and then you're going to say, get it and give it back to them. Now what that does is it teaches them that dropping it is worth it. Not only do they get a food reward, but they also get the toy back. Whoa, double reward. So obviously when you're out on walks, your dog is not always, is not going to be getting some of those things back in his mouth. But for now, while we're teaching this, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be building up this nice savings account in his drop account and teaching him that it's worth it to do these things. Slowly, once they are really solid at dropping their toy, um, lots of different toys, getting them excited and amped up with these different toys. You know, the longer and more into it they get, the harder it is to drop because you're building value and excitement. Then you could move to step two, which would be taking the food out of your hand, asking for your dog to go on faith that you're going to follow up with a food reward and you just do the visual signal. So I repeat that exact same signal, boop, come up to their face. He's like, hey, I think I know what this is. We've trained this a lot. I'm going to go on faith that mom's still going to pay me for this, even though it's not right there on my nose. Dog opens. Let's go of the toy. Yeah, good job. And then pay, take the food away and repeat. And you do that. Very last thing is taking on that word. Whatever you want to call it to, to mean to your dog to open their mouth and let go of that thing. It doesn't matter what the word is, honestly. Um, sometimes I'll say if your dog is, you've already used a word and they're not good at it, go with something different because that word has already been watered down. And if we start out with something fresh, it might be easier for them to pick up. So if I wanted to say, use the word out because I've already ruined drop, I would say that word first, then I would make the hand signal that my dog knows. So I'd say out, pause for a second, hand signal. And I repeat that over and over again. Now, the reason we're putting in first is because that is the thing your dog doesn't know, followed by the thing that they do know. And if you do that enough times in a row, he's gonna say, hey, every time mom says out, she then puts her hand up to me. And I know what that means. I wanna cut to the chase and get the goods. So that's when you'll start seeing them respond to that verbal cue that you put in front of the visual cue and boom, they're dropping it when you say out. So learning a verbal cue is hard. Um, I I'll always stress that with folks. Um, our dogs are very visual. Um, so it will take a lot of repetitions to really get solid on that verbal. I mean, if you think about it, we're talking all the time. And if they hadn't learned to kind of turn us off um, and stop listening to us, they might go a little crazy. 
I know I would. <laughs> so um, that was how you would teach drop. And then once they got good at with their stuff in the, the house, then you could start working on other things that I would first set up as illegal but safe items that you could use like recycling, stuff in recycling container that smell yummy, um, like cardboard boxes, empty cans. I would even use paper towels. That's a, that's one. Um, and just kind of as many things as you can think of that are safe. Um, and then on top of that, I would also teach a dog leave it so that um, I, when I was out on a walk, I could see them spy something. And before they even had their mouth on it, I could say, leave it, which means don't touch. And I don't even have to worry about asking him to drop it. I know that can be hard though sometimes, um, especially different neighborhoods. We all seem to have like different trash sort of things in our neighborhood. One area has goose poop. The other has chicken bones, you name it. And Sunday, it's just, it's hard to scan for them all. That's for sure. All right. So let's see here. Next, we have, how can I have my dog listen at the dog park? At home, she's great. Dog park, not at all. Not surprising. So your dog goes to the dog park. You go with them there because they love it. They enjoy being at the dog park. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to build up a really solid calming when called, or we also call it a recall, um, first out of the dog park context to teach them that it's super awesome and willing and, and worthy of coming to you away from stuff that they may be liking. Then add in the dogs and at the dog park. Now, when I go to add in this, um, I call it my uh, emergency coming when called. When I go to add this into something that I know is super distracting for a dog, like the dog park, I would not try and do it when I first got there. So this is a sort of situation where I'd be wanting, wanting to be thinking about um, how saturated they were. How long had they been at the dog park? You know, were they finally at that part where they were taking breaks and kind of wandering away from the dogs? Or was it you were getting close to the end of your time, but not quite at the end of your time, and they're starting to look a little tired from all the play and maybe hanging around with you more? That would be a perfect time to start practicing it not trying to do it mid play. They're not ready for that yet. So first you would start after they've been saturated, um, get some really good and successful recalls in there, then start to practice it when they're less and less saturated. Now, a big thing about our coming when called with dogs is thinking about what we're using them for. So uh, I said my emergency recall. So emergency recall I see as something that I'm going to build up and protect it like it's gold. And I am not going to use it ever as a fun ender. Um, and that fun ender is what our dog says is a fun ender. So if you were to call your dog away from the other dogs while they're playing, uh, they come to you, they're like, okay, cool, this is awesome. I, re I remember we were playing this at home and I got food. And then you snapped on that leash and you took them out of the dog park. The next time you go to say this word, they're gonna say, mm -hmm. I don't know, man. Last time it wasn't so fun. Maybe I wanna stay over here and not waste my behavior energy going to them if I'm not gonna get to go back to what I was doing. So um, I would, when I'm practicing that in the dog park, I would be practicing letting them go back so that it's not the ultimate fun ender. And then I'd also teach what I call an informal recall that's really easy for me to use in lots of different contexts and all over the place. And that would be hand targeting. Um, so I would teach them how to run and touch my hand because uh, I could do that. I can do like 50 times in a day. Just boop, 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 
using it when I'm on walks, using it to move my dog around constantly. I use it to move um, my dog around in the yard. You know, if I can get him closer to me, then it's much easier for him to come out from sunbathing and go inside. At that point, he's like, eh, I'm already halfway there, third way there. Okay, I'll go in there. So I would use, teach something like both an informal and a formal coming when called. I think everybody should have a formal coming when called, that emergency one, because that's going to save you if you're at a dog park and a fight happens and you want to make sure your dog stays the heck out of that. Um, so that is one case you could use there. Now, the big thing is that you want to be very careful about food rewards when you're at the dog park. Uh, you, if you're carrying these really yummy, stinky rewards to practice your emergency coming when called or your touch for that matter, you could all of a sudden become very popular. And then we could get some squabbles for the dogs trying to get to this yummy resource that they can smell. So I am a big fan of using travel tubes. So this is just a three ounce silicone tube and I could fill this with peanut butter or squeeze cheese or excuse me, canned dog food. And then I can have an on the go, boop, give them a little lick and then close it back up. Now, even though I use peanut butter as an example, peanut butter is not something I would take to a dog park. I should have. It's actually, I'm glad that I made that mistake because that way somebody won't accidentally do it. And my reason for it is because I have had dogs where they're eating the peanut butter and, you know, it's kind of sticky. And then another dog comes up to be like, what you got? And stick their face in there and they're, get away from me. So we want something that is really high value, easy for you to pack it, pack it back up and put it in your pocket. It goes away. They can't smell it. And the dog can swallow really quickly. So... Canned dog food is my favorite for that, um, for this sort of thing. All right, that's my thing about food rewards. Okay, um, I'll do one more, one more question and then we'll be done for the half hour. Um, you guys are welcome to put more comments in there and I've got some leftover that I'm gonna start out with um, at our next bi-weekly Q&A for people. Um, and you're welcome to always send us, um, in the meantime, questions. I keep an eye on our Facebook page where we um, show you the email and where to put those. Okay, next up, we've got Mary asking, do you know of a good dog behaviorist? Do you do it? So, um, dog trait, so I'm pausing because of the word behaviorist. So, uh, there's so many different words that people call themselves and there's really no regulation in the dog training industry, which just makes my job really hard. Um, I would, I would say what you would, what you would, if you're looking for a behaviorist, you're looking for somebody who's a, pro a professional, who is a behavior consultant is one thing that they'll be called. Um, and you would want to be looking at their their qualifications on uh, what credentials do they have? What groups are they part of um, that they commit to force free training and um, and are very committed to science based methods? Um, ideally, that they've had formal training at one of the professional dog training schools um, and that they also have experience with working with behavior issues. Teaching a dog to sit is different than teaching a dog that approaching their resource is something that leads to good things. It's not easy and you need to know what you're doing. So you'd be looking for a behavior consultant. Um, if you go to our website, um, you will see um, all of my certifications. So I am a professional dog trainer and behavior consultant and I went to the Academy for Dog Trainers. Um, I also am a certified separation anxiety trainer and a couple others on there too. Um, and you'll also find that there on the, the, there's a public owner resources page. If you scroll down, it'll help you to find a dog trainer and let you know how to make sure that you're protecting yourself and your dogs and what questions to ask and what to look for. So, all right. 
Well, thank you everybody for joining us today and bringing us your questions and keep those questions coming in and we'll see you in another two weeks. All right, bye.